In this session, we're going to talk about Internet Exchange Point history and Internet Exchange Point design. And before we go into the design details, I'd like to take a little bit of a review of where the Internet Exchange Points came from. This is not a complete history, but it's intended to show where the Internet Exchange Points came from and why they were considered to be so important back in the earlier days of the Internet, and why today we simply cannot live without them. So if we start back in the late 80s, there was the National Science Foundation Network, which was one major backbone. It was very much the Internet as it was known back then. It was funded by the United States National Science Foundation, and it connected academic and research institutions together on this early network infrastructure. It also connected a few private company networks under an acceptable use policy at various network access points across the United States. And the acceptable use policy was very strict. It said no commercial activity. And we'll come back to this. There were four network access points, one in Chicago run by Ameritech, one in New York, run by Sprint, one in San Francisco, run by Pacific Bell, and one in Vienna, Virginia, run by MFS. You'll note that these four operators were all major telecom providers in the United States. As the internet developed, private companies needed to interconnect their networks too. They could certainly access the NSFnet through these network access points, but these network access points prohibited the use of commercial traffic across the interconnect. So they could not use the NSF net. For example, a commercial operator on the east coast of the United States wanting to talk to a commercial entity on the west coast of the United States could not cross the NSF net. They needed their own way of getting there. This resulted in the first commercial ISPs being formed, and, of course, it resulted in the first commercial internet exchanges being created as well. The two best known were Kix West, which was on the west coast of the United States in the Bay Area, and there was May East on the east coast of the United States in Virginia. Along with these, the Routing Arbiter project was created to help with the coordination of routing exchange between providers. Traffic from ISPA needed to get to ISPB, and the routing arbiter helped document the policy used to achieve this. The routing arbiter is no more, and it's long since been superseded by today's Internet Routing Registries, the IRR. In fact, the RADB is well known to many operators today, and it is the only remnant of this routing arbiter project. The end of the NSFnet in 1995 meant the move towards full commercial internet. Private companies were selling the bandwidth in North America and Europe and in parts of Asia. The network access points established late in the NSFnet life were some of these original exchange points. The issue was the NAP operators were providing commercial internet access as well. And so the Sprint, PacBell, and Ameritech NAPs disappeared and were replaced by the neutral or commercial internet exchange points. The MFS hosted May East replaced the Vienna NAP in more or less the same location. ANS won the contract to operate the late NSF net, were forced to join these exchange points as well. A global distributed global internet exchange was proposed in the mid-90s, but this never happened. It was planned to be Kix West, May East, the new Swedish exchange point, and a proposed interconnect in Paris. The Swedish exchange point was formed in Stockholm late 1992. Three major ISPs interconnected, and the main aim there was for latency reduction and performance gains and, of course, to keep local traffic local. Lynx was formed in London in 1994. 
the five UK network operators at the time interconnected, again, for latency reduction, performance gains, and so that local traffic stays local. The main feature of links at the time was, in the absence of any European telecoms deregulation, was to reduce the huge cost of crossing the Atlantic Ocean to get to the US part of the internet. In fact, Lynx was proposed to be part of the DGIX when the Paris option fell through. But as I mentioned earlier, DGIX never happened. In Asia, HKIX was formed in Hong Kong in 1995. Again, a vibrant internet community, several small operators, again looking for latency, performance, and local traffic benefits, rather than having to haul traffic all the way across the Pacific Ocean to interconnect in the United States. And this model continued with several other European exchange points being formed in 1996, 1997, and so on. Today, we know about M6, DKX, very well-known exchange points in Europe, and were joined by many other smaller ones in several European countries. The exchange point was here to stay. So what is it? Well, an exchange point is a neutral location where network operators freely interconnect the networks to exchange traffic. Physically, it is nothing more than an Ethernet switch located in this neutral location. How most exchange points work today is that the exchange point host, whoever that may be, provides the switch and the rack space for that switch and the devices that accompany the exchange point. The network operators usually bring routers and interconnect them via the exchange point fabric. It's a very, very simple concept. Any place where providers meet to exchange traffic. So what are they? Well, an exchange point today runs at layer two, and we use Ethernet. Ethernet today, 100 gigabits per second at the largest exchange points, 10 gigabits, 1 gigabits are very, very common interconnect speeds. 100 megabits, we're seeing less of, as the 1 gigabit te technology becomes so readily available on even the low-end managed switches. There were several other technologies used for exchange points in the past, including ATM, Frame Relay, SRP, FIDI, and SMDS. I'll leave that as an exercise to you to look them up in your history books. There were also Layer 3 exchange points, and this is now historical as well. It was router-based, and the best-known example was Kix West. It was a very early model Cisco router that went through a few iterations, but the router very quickly became overwhelmed by the sophisticated requirements of the rapidly growing internet. There were several issues, including manageability, scalability, and general throughput. And so the layer three exchange point is no more and is not an option for exchange points created today.